All right, guys, today we'll go through the lower extremity part two. Again, we're going to focus a lot on the clinical applications um, of the lower extremity or the leg because in the lab, you guys did most of the actual straight anatomy. We'll start by talking about chondromalacia patella. Um, chondro meaning cartilage. So in this case, we're talking about the cartilage that sits underneath the patella. Um, just really quick, let's think about what the patella does. Remember the patella is a sesamoid bone that develops in conjunction with the quadriceps tendon. So um, when the quadriceps, your, your um, anterior muscles of your thigh, contract to extend the leg, um, the, the quadriceps tendon kind of goes over the patella like a pulley system. Right, so like when you pull a rope over a pulley, you can lift more weight that way. So because of the way that the quadriceps tendon goes over the patella, the quads are stronger. Um, <clears throat> chondromalacia patella occurs when the cartilage under the patella softens and starts to deteriorate. This is common um, when the quadriceps are overused. So this is really common, for example, in marathon runners. Uh, again, you know, running is constant. Uh, flexion extension, flexion extension, flexion extension. And every time that you extend, the quads are pulling on that quadriceps tendon and um, you're, you're utilizing the patella. Um, it's also common in uh, like tennis or basketball players. Um, a lot of like young athletic patients will get chondromalacia patella just due to overuse of the quadriceps tendon and the patella. This is nicknamed runner's knee, uh, runner's knee because it's common in patients that run um, considerable distances. You can also see this in older patients who are arthritic, so older patients who have arthritis in the knee, um, but it's really common in, in young athletic patients. Um, this can occur when there's a blow directly to the patella um, or extreme flexion of the knee, so like extreme bending of the knee. Um, most common due to overuse though. So symptoms of chondromalacia patella include pain in and around the knee, um, a grinding sensation upon flexion of the knee. So the patient can normally feel that. Sometimes you can hear that. You can feel it when you put your hand on the knee. Um, this grinding sensation is kind of common as we age anyways, um, but it's uh, exacerbated or it's, it's worse when chondromalacia patella is present. Um, kneeling or squatting can be painful for patients because as you really flex the knee, um, you stretch that quadriceps tendon against the patella and push the patella down on the cartilage. Um, pain with this typically worsens upon activity where you have a lot of flexion and extension. For example, like going upstairs um, when patients, you know, say, oh, I go up a couple flights of stairs and then my knee is just killing me. Um, that's a, another sign. Um, typically, what we recommend is RICE. Uh, RICE is the acronym for um, the way that we typically treat inflammation. So rest, ice, compression, and elevation. That will help kind of decrease the inflammation. Uh, rest is the big thing. They can't be using it constantly or it's just going to continue to irritate the cartilage. Um, NSAIDs can be helpful with pain. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so things like naproxen or ibuprofen. Um, this can heal with just rest itself, um, you know, rest and just like we have here, treating the inflammation. Um, some patients might need physical therapy. Um, many young people who have chondromalacia patella will heal completely on their own, um, and then, you know, they won't have any symptoms at all as, as they're adults. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's going to be in pain for the rest of their lives. A replaced obturator artery or an accessory obturator artery is a very common arterial variant that we have down um, in the, the lower pelvis and going in towards the leg. 20% um, of patients have an accessory obturator artery. So a fifth of patients have this. It's a very common arterial variant that we need to be aware of, um, especially when doing things like hernia repairs or any procedures in the area. So typically what happens is um, if you look at this picture on the top, so first off the very top, you can see 
Let me change colors. You can see the common iliac artery splitting into the external iliac and the internal iliac. Um, you can also see a one of the branches off of the external iliac, which is the inferior epigastric artery. That's that little tiny branch curling up. Um, if you look in at the internal iliac artery, one of the major branches is the obturator artery, which is named obturator because it goes through the obturator foramen, which is this large hole in the pelvis. Typically, this yellow vessel that's right here, um, that's connecting the, the external artery, um, iliac artery branch with the internal iliac artery branch, typically that vessel is not there. There's no cur like connection there. Um, if there is, that's the accessory obturator artery that we're talking about. That's the variant, is if this actually exists. Um, it's also referred to as the corona mortis um, and does create kind of a, a circular, right, like a, a crown. Um, so the artery runs across or close to the femoral ring um, to reach the, go down towards the obturator foramen. Um, this artery is problematic um, because one, it can be involved in a strangulated femoral hernia. So it can actually get pushed down in that femoral hernia. Um, and even more problematic is the possibility of damaging the artery during procedures in the area, and then the patient will be bleeding out. Uh, and it's kind of confusing why the patient's bleeding out because none of the normal arteries have been um, you know, cut at all. So for example, caution when placing staples for an inguinal or femoral hernia, um, you don't want to be placing the staples to repair the hernia and accidentally puncture um, or break in some way this obturator, um, accessory obturator artery. Trochanteric bursitis is a bursitis or inflammation of the bursa, um, specifically of the trochanteric bursa. The trochanteric bursa is the bursa between the greater trochanter and the gluteus maximus. So if you look at the picture here, um, think about the femur, right? The femur is like right underneath in here and it has a lesser trochanter medially and laterally it has a greater trochanter. The greater trochanter is like the, the part that um, protrudes out laterally the most. So the um, trochanteric bursa is this little fluid filled sac that goes between the muscle, um, the gluteus maximus, and the actual trochanter itself. Um, also kind of notice here, the gluteus medius um, is gonna come over here and it's going to insert right over that area. So kind of in our differential diagnosis, we'll see that a tear of the gluteus medius presents in a very similar way to the trochanteric bursitis. So that is something that should be in your differential diagnosis. Um, a tear of the gluteus medius is often kind of overlooked as a possibility. Um, but trochanteric bursitis um, <clears throat> is a very common cause of hip pain. It typically presents as a deep pain in the lateral hip and thigh. So kind of originating in the lateral hip and then radiating down the lateral thigh. Um, this can occur because of trauma to the area, right? Trauma to the lateral hip can irritate that bursa. Um, it can occur because of overuse, uh, overuse of um, the, gluteus, um, the gluteus maximus. So running, biking, stairs, anything that uses the glutes. Um, also lying on the side for a prolonged period of time, especially if it's on a hard surface. So like sleeping on the floor for a while or somebody goes camping and they spent a week sleeping on the hard ground with a sleeping bag, um, that can cause trochanteric bursitis. Um, symptoms include point tenderness over the greater trochanter. So you guys should be able to palpate the greater trochanter if when you um, push on that area, the patient experiences tenderness or pain, that's a sign. This pain, again, typically radiates down the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial, um, iliotibial tract or iliotibial band is a longitudinal fibrous sheath that runs along the lateral thigh. 
Um, so it's just like a fibrous sheath that goes just inferior to the tensor fasciolata. Um, essentially for our purposes, the patient will have point tenderness on the lateral hip. And when you push on the great trochanter, and they'll tell you that their lateral hip hurts and it hurts down the lateral thigh. Um, the uh, pain typically worsens with use um, of the gluteal muscles. So like pain worsens during stair climbing um, or pain worsens when the patient goes, um, like if they stand from a seated position, right? Like think of when you do squats, you use your glutes, right? So squats are kind of like sitting down and standing up. Um, so when the patient stands from sitting and they have to use their glutes, it'll hurt more. They'll have a, a more of a deep pain there on the side. Ischial bursitis is a bursitis that occurs or an inflammation that occurs with the ischial bursa. Um, remember that the, or the ischial bursa is over the ischial tuberosity between the ischial tuberosity and the gluteus maximus muscle. Um, if you look here, you can see the ischial bursa. This is in like the back bottom of the pelvis. Remember, I um, the ischial tuberosity is kind of what we would call your butt bone. So when you sit on someone's lap, or if someone sits on your lap and their butt feels bony, that bone that you're feeling protrude is the ischial tuberosity. So the ischial tuberosity is what supports our weight when we're sitting. Um, again, on top of the ischial tuberosity or between the tuberosity and the muscle is the ischial bursa. So you can imagine when you're sitting for a long period of time, you're putting excess friction and pressure on that ischial bursa. That excess friction um, or you know, pressure can cause inflammation of the bursa. Um, <clears throat> ischial bursitis is common in um, cyclists. So if you picture a cyclist, not only are they you know, having a constant or frequent contraction of the gluteus maximus, which lies over that bursa, but they're sitting for a very long period of time. And as they're kind of sitting and moving their legs, those the bursa are rubbing. There's a lot of friction between your tuberosities and the seat itself. So in long distance cyclists, this is very common. Um, also in people, patients who sit on hard surfaces for long periods of time. Um, so like if somebody works in a factory where they're sewing clothes and they're sitting on a hard chair, not a soft, but a hard chair all day long, um, that can end up causing an ischial bursitis. Um, <clears throat> the kind of symptoms of ischial bursitis are a low grade aching pain over the ischial tuberosity. Um, this is typically worsened by anything that would irritate the, um, the bursa. So again, like sitting for a long period um, is going to worsen that inflammation and worsen the pain. Um, also stretching the gluteus maximus, because again, the gluteus maximus goes over the top of the bursa. So when you stretch the gluteus maximus, it pushes on that bursa and that can um, increase the pain in that specific area. Um, we treat this just like any other bursitis um, with rest, um, ice, so that you can kind of allow that inflammation to go down. Um, we also uh, recommend NSAIDs. Notice I didn't have the whole rest, ice, compression, elevation. This is a very difficult area for compression to occur. Also elevation, um, elevating the, the bottom of your butt is kind of difficult. We don't want patients to be in like the downward dog position all day. So really just the rest and ice components of rice. Um, also NSAIDs, again, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as long as they're not contraindicated in the patient, um, those can help with the pain um, as well as with some of the inflammation. Pressure sores. Um, pressure sores are sores that um, literally exactly what they sound like. They're sores or like um, anything from a slight little wound to a complete ulceration of the skin that occurs due to excessive pressure on one specific area of the body. Um, pressure sores are common in patients who are in the same position for a very long period of time. 
So in wheelchair bound patients, for example, wheelchair bound patients are sitting um, for really all of the time. Um, and that puts an excessive amount of stress, for example, on the ischial tuberosities, because that's what bears our weight when sitting. Um, also, um, in patients who are, you know, for example, in the hospital for a long period of time, or patients who are in, um, you know, long-term care facilities, patients need to be turned on a regular basis so that it's not one part of the body that's constantly holding the weight. Um, the problem with this is when there's one part of the body that constantly has all of the pressure on it, that impedes blood flow to that part of the body. Um, so it, it's kind of multiple, like the problems are, are, um, are twofold. One, you have excessive friction on that area. Two, you don't have blood flow to that area. Um, so the area starts to develop a slight sore and then that kind of the stages progress um, as it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, here you can see all the way from stage one to stage four. Um, stage one here, um, <clears throat> the person's just starting to get a little bit of an ulceration. Um, here's stage two, you can see that it's worsening. Stage three, here in this inguinal crease is an example of a stage three. Um, this here is another example of a stage three ulceration. Um, and then here, stage four, you can see over the sacrum um, or here down this ischial ulcers over the ischial tuberosity. Um, this is also a stage four, um, which is there in that gluteal crease. So stage one through four um, just goes depending on the depth of the ulceration. Stage one is shallow, stage four is deep. Um, so stage four is the worst. Again, common in areas that support the pressure of the body and that also increases. Um, so in skin folds. So we see like ischial tuberosities because that supports the weight. Um, we see here on the, sa the sacrum in the lower spine because that supports the weight when somebody is like laying down. Um, here we see over the uh, greater tubercle because that supports the weight when you're laying on your side. Um, the others are in skin folds. So here, this iliac crease is a skin fold. Um, here, the, the um, infragluteal crease, that's a skin fold. Um, these are very common, again, in debilitated patients, whether the patient's you know, paralyzed or in long-term care or the ICU. Um, treatment ranges from you know, cleaning, keeping the pressure off of it and allowing it to heal, all the way to surgical closure. Um, if we have to surgically close the ulceration, um, how we perform that kind of depends on how large the wound is and the shape of the wound. We can do what's called direct closure of small sores. So direct closure is when you, you know, directly piece one side together with the other side and stitch them together. So like this here um, in the inguinal fold, that could be directly closed. It's easy to match up the sides to each other um, and you know, do a direct closure. Um, any linear sore, it's easy to just do direct closure. If you have a large kind of circular sore, you can't do direct closure. The sides are too far apart. If you pull them together, you're, you're pulling too hard and there's too much tension and those sutures are just going to tear. In that case, we do what's called a flap closure. This picture at the bottom here, this is showing you a flap closure. And a flap co closure is interesting because initially it looks like you're actually causing more harm because you're making a huge incision. Um, but the idea with the flap closure is you need to create a loose flap of skin and you rotate that healthy flap of skin um, up and over the wound to help close the wound. So if you look at this picture, you can see where they've cut. You see the ulcer up top, and then you see where they've cut. It's wide, and then the, the cut gets narrower and narrower as it goes down. What they're going to do is rotate this patch of healthy skin here up over the wound and stitch that in. Um, and that kind of pulls this, this skin all or the tissue all up superiorly 
But then if you look at the bottom of this, these edges are going to be close enough together that we can just stitch the edges directly to each other. And what you end up with is um, a, a wound that's all closed up like you see in the picture on the right. So here we see the kind of three different levels of hamstring injuries. First, let's just review what we're talking about here. The hamstrings, remember, are the muscles that are in the posterior compartment of the thigh. Um, so at the back of the thigh, we can see here um, the biceps femoris. Um, the biceps femoris kind of coming laterally. And then medially, we have the semitendinosus on top and the semimembranosus underneath. These hamstring muscles, these muscles attach um, the back of the pelvis to the ischial tuberosity, and then they extend down and attach down to the back of the knee. Um, <clears throat> the hamstring muscles are used in order to flex your knee, so flexion at the knee. Hamstring strains are common in athletes who run. Um, especially when a quick start is needed, when all of a sudden you go from nothing to an extreme contraction of the hamstrings. So sprinters, for example, um, baseball players, right? So, you know, they're standing there on first base and they're just waiting to be able to sprint to second base. Um, martial arts where patients kick, that's another one. Kicking when patients, um, you know, go or when somebody goes from just standing to all of a sudden snapping their leg out very, very hard and fast, um, that can injure the hamstrings. The rapid exertion of the muscles causes um, a tear either in um, through the muscle itself or at the proximal attachment to the ischial tuberosity. We grade these hamstring injuries, grade one, two or three. Um, grade one is the least severe, grade three is the worst. So grade one is a strain. So there's not any actual tearing through the muscles themselves, um, but you've caused irritation and inflammation in the muscles. Grade two occurs when there's a partial tear. So it has not completely torn the muscle. Um, you still have some function in the muscle, but this is, you know, obviously considerably worse than just a strain and requires, um, you know, longer, longer rest and more treatment. Uh, I'll talk about treatment in a second. Grade three is when there's a complete tear. Like there's a pop, there's a complete tear through the hamstring muscles and you lose function. Um, patients will experience pain in the posterior thigh, the worse the tear, the, the worse the pain. Um, patients will frequently report if there's a grade three where there's a complete tear, they hear a pop. They'll hear that pop when the muscle actually tears. Um, we'll frequently see bruising and swelling in the posterior thigh. Um, and then again, if there's a complete tear, patients will not be able to use the leg. Um, in general, we always recommend rice, um, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Um, we recommend NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for the pain um, and inflammation. Grade one generally will heal in a few days if patients just rest and treat it with rice. Grade two and three take um, a longer period of, of rest in order to heal. Um, grade two will generally still heal with uh, rice and NSAIDs, but again, you're going to be, you know, it's going to be weeks of rest as opposed to days of rest. If there's a complete rupture, um, it might take months of rest in order to completely heal on its own. Um, so, you know, kind of days to weeks to months, depending on the severity. Um, they do typically heal on their own though. Um, they do typically heal without requiring any surgical intervention. So we'll talk about the, um, just a minute about the popliteal pulse. Um, <clears throat> this is something that you'll, you'll take during you know, specific parts of a physical exam. Um, the popliteal artery is the artery that runs deep through the popliteal fossa. So it's running through the back of the knee. The popliteal fossa is that little depression that you feel in the back of the knee. Um, the popliteal artery 
is an extension or a continuation of the femoral artery. So you can see, for example, the femoral artery starts in the inguinal area um, and it comes along the medial side of the femur and then wraps around the back of the femur. Um, the popliteal artery, I mean, sorry, the femoral artery. That's what the femoral artery does. Um, the femoral artery turns into the popliteal artery at the back of the knee. Um, and then it continues down until it becomes the posterior tibial and anterior tibial arteries. Um, here you can see the section of the vessel that is the popliteal artery. Um, we palpate the popliteal artery um, in order to you know, ensure that that blood flow is, is continuing down the leg, um, that there's adequate blood flow through the femur, through the popliteal artery, and then getting down to the inferior region of the leg. Um, the popliteal artery is vulnerable in knee dislocations. Um, so like if we're trying to check that the femoral artery is intact, we'll check the popliteal pulse, right? Because if there's no popliteal pulse, that means blood's not coming down the femoral artery. If we're trying to check to make sure that the popliteal artery is intact, so like if there's a knee dislocation, um, and you want to make sure that the popliteal artery is okay, then you want to check a downstream pulse because you want to make sure that the blood's getting through the popliteal artery and then down, further down the leg. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, in order to palpate the popliteal pulse, um, you want the patient to be prone, legging on their belly with the knee flexed. When the knee is straight, and you can feel it right now, feel the back of your knee. When you straighten your leg, it's hard back there, right? Like the tissue is hard and stretched out. When you bend your leg, it's soft and pliable. Um, so you want the patient laying on their belly with the knee flexed so that that popliteal fossa is nice and soft. Um, use your thumbs to palpate deeply in the inferior popliteal fossa. And I can feel it right now my knee. If I just lift up my thigh and I let my knee kind of hang softly, I can feel it. Um, you should feel the popliteal pulse in both knees and compare. Um, if it's weaker in one leg or if it's absent, that indicates that there's some sort of femoral artery obstruction on that side. Shin splints are um, very common um, kind of uh, pain that's experienced in the anterior, um, like anterior tibial region, the front of the lower leg. Um, shin splints occur due to overexertion of the muscles in the anterior compartment of the leg. Um, this is mainly the tibialis anterior. Um, the tibialis anterior is the very front muscle um, in the front of the anterior leg. It is just lateral to where you can palpate the tibia. So you can palpate that the tibia is like a really bony structure right in the subcutaneous tissue. And if you just kind of um, fall off laterally from there, what you're touching is the tibialis anterior. It's a soft tissue just lateral to the tibia. Um, repetitive use of the tibialis anterior causes small little tears um, in the periosteum of the tibia or in the deep fascia of the leg. Um, that causes um, the little tears, cause edema and pain. Um, it's kind of a mild form of compartment syndrome. Um, the edema that's there, you know, that, that swelling that occurs causes um, like compression inside that anterior compartment of the leg because that fascia is not elastic. Um, <clears throat> this is not something that needs surgical intervention or anything like that. It just needs some rest. Um, so we recommend rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Um, patients will experience pain like when they walk, for example, um, you know, upon flexion and extension of the, uh, of the foot. Um, typically, it's also very tender to the touch. So if you push on the um, tibialis anterior at all, patients will experience pain. Um, <clears throat> but again, just rest, ice, compression, and elevation gets rid of the inflammation, and then this is fine. It's common in runners. Or if people start running and they're not used to running, they'll typically get shin splints. Okay, so here you guys can see the compartments of the leg, um, and we're talking about the, the lower leg, so not the thigh, but the lower leg, uh, distal to the knee. 
um, the compartments of the leg, there are four. There's anterior, lateral, deep posterior, and superficial posterior. Um, these fascial compartments are relatively closed at the joints. So they, they're relatively closed at the knee and at the ankle. Um, um, so if you look at the picture here, the um, you can see the two bones of the leg. You see the tibia here um, and then the fibula laterally. So since you know the fibula is laterally, you know that this green compartment over here is the lateral compartment. Um, here in the front in yellow, that's the anterior compartment. And then you can see um, the deep posterior compartment and then in blue, the superficial posterior compartment. Um, remember what we're talking about here um, is you know muscles that are contained in inelastic fascial sheets, fascial coverings. Um, <clears throat> because these are relatively um, uh, relatively closed at the ends, it does kind of limit the spread of infection from one area to another. Um, infection with separation, right, like pus formation, can lead to increased intracompartmental pressure. Um, because the pus has nowhere to go, right? And remember the deep fascia and the septa, they're non-elastic, so they don't stretch. So if pus starts to accumulate in that fascial compartment, there's nowhere for that extra fluid to go and it starts to create too much pressure. Um, if this is severe, um, then a fasciotomy might be necessary. Remember when we cut the fascia in order to open the compartment and decrease um, the pressure, relieve the pressure in that compartment. And then we debris pockets of infection, clean out the little pockets of infection, and we allow the tissue to heal before closing um, the fascia. Um, looking at, again, like the way that infection can spread, um, and in the anterior and posterior compartments, um, infection spreads in a distal fashion. Um, the lateral compartment infection spreads proximally into the popliteal fossa. Um, <clears throat> the, in the lateral compartment, like when we look at the way that the infection spreads, it kind of follows the common fibular nerve. Um, like the way that the common fibular nerve passes down through um, like that popliteal fossa. <clears throat> common fibular nerve injury, um, or this is also called the peroneal nerve. Um, common fibular nerve injury is the most common nerve that's injured in the leg. Um, the reason for this is because of the position of the nerve as it kind of passes down into the leg. Um, the common fibular nerve winds laterally around the fibular neck, um, which is like the proximal part of the fibula up top by the knee. It winds laterally around the fibular neck in the subcutaneous area. So it's really close to the surface, um, which puts it at risk from like direct trauma. So if you have direct trauma to the lateral knee, you can damage the nerve. Um, fracture of the fibular neck, so any like trauma to the lateral leg can damage the fibula and fracture that thin point at the fibular neck and that can damage the nerve. Um, knee injuries can damage it because it passes right behind the knee and then wraps around the fibula. Um, knee dislocations, again, same thing. If the knee dislocates, that can pull on the nerve and damage the nerve. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that can kind of damage the common fibular nerve just because of its location, the path that it takes. Um, <clears throat> because it's superficial and lateral. Lateral means there's more stuff coming at the body laterally than medially. And then it's superficial, so it doesn't have most, much protection. Um, the common fibular nerve innervates all of the muscles in the anterior and lateral compartments of the leg. So if it's severed, if there's complete damage to the common fibular nerve, we have complete paralysis of all of the muscles in the anterior and lateral compartment. This means that we completely lose dorsiflexion and eversion of the foot. So if this was my foot, dorsiflexion is when you point your toes up. So you can't point your toes up, right? Think about every step you take. Every step you take, you pick your toes up so that you can then plant your foot down. You lose that. 
Um, eversion, not as important. Eversion is when you tilt your foot outward. So like the sole of your foot could go in or out. So that's tilting your foot laterally or out. Dorsiflexion is a big one. Because of this, patients have what we call foot drop. Foot drop means the foot drops, right? When you pick up your leg to take a step, your foot should dorsiflex, but it doesn't, it hangs. If the foot is hanging, you functionally have the limb or a limb that's too long, right? Like picture if your foot hangs, that, that leg is longer than the other one functionally. Um, so the leg can't clear the ground when walking normally. Right? And if you just take normal steps, letting your foot hang, the toes, right, the toes are going to drag on the ground and then not be in the right position to step. So this results in patients compensating with kind of odd steps, like different types of walking to compensate for that foot drop. Um, for example, a waddling gait. A waddling gait is when the patient leans towards the unaffected side to raise the hip of the long leg. Right, that means the long leg is kind of like the right, the right length now and doesn't drag. Um, a swing out gait, this is when instead of bringing the leg directly forward, you bring it wide, like you, you swing the leg around wide in order to kind of clear the ground. Um, a steppage gait is when you just bend your knee a lot. It's like, like you're marching or something, like the leg is too long. So if you just bend the knee really and bring the leg up really high, the leg doesn't drag anymore. Um, and then you, you kind of kick the foot out so that the foot like flexes up and lands correctly. Um, all of these again, are just trying to kind of help your foot clear the ground because it's dragging and then kind of kick the foot into the right position when it lands. Um, Loss of sensation in the anterior in, in anterior lateral leg is kind of variable. Like the loss of sensation is variable. Um, however, the paralysis is like a solid finding here, um, a solid sign that's the same in everyone that the common fibular nerve has been severed. Um, keep in mind, though, that there are multiple things that can result in one limb being too long. So just because you see a patient walk with one of these gates, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be common fibular nerve injury. You need to investigate further and right? have the patient sit down and ask them to dorsiflex their foot. If they can't, then yeah, that's a problem. But if they're just walking in this pattern, it could just be that the one leg is too long. Um, so for example, like pelvic tilt. Um, can result in one leg being longer than the other. Um, spastic contraction of the soleus can result in, you know, the toe pointing. Um, so plantar flexion. So that could result in kind of the same type of issue um, as far as walking goes. Um, here, just to show you guys the common fibular nerve, um, you can see the common fibular nerve coming down and wrapping laterally around the um, fibula. Um, again, if you look kind of here, um, you can see the, the kind of passage of the common fibular nerve. Um, the common fibular nerve is a branch of the sciatic nerve um, that goes lateral and or lateral and inferior to the knee. It splits into the superficial and deep fibular nerve. So like the um, common fibular nerve comes down and then once you kind of go lateral and wrap around the, the um, fibula, it divides and we have the superficial fibular nerve and the deep fibular nerve, um, which you guys can see here. Um, <clears throat> so here on this thing, same thing, I've kind of starred the common fibular nerve. Um, you can see it kind of coming back around, comes from back kind of the, the posterior lateral aspect of the knee and wraps around the, the, the fibula. And then you can see it splits into the um, superficial fibular nerve and the deep fibular nerve. This is showing us the cutaneous innervation, um, but again, that's 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 not quite as precise um, as the the muscle involvement. Okay, so um, continuing on with the fibular nerves, 
um, deep fibular nerve entrapment. Um, it's also referred to as ski boot syndrome because it's common in patients who have ski boots that are too tight. Um, so they put their ski boots on and they lash them and it's this really, really tight um, boot that's literally squeezing their, their calf area um, or their leg where the fibular nerves are. Um, <clears throat> so kind of over compression of this area, or this can also occur in um, like soccer players or um, runners with overly tight shoes um, or anyone with overly tight boots, just common in ski boots. Um, the compression causes entrapment of the deep fi um, fibular nerve. This entrapment causes pain in the dorsum of the foot that radiates between the first and second toes. So pain along the top of the foot that radiates between the big toe and the first toe and your um, pointer toe. Um, excessive use of the muscles in the anterior compartment um, can also cause edema that entraps the deep fibular nerve. Um, so like we were just talking about um, like, you know, running, you know, a lot of, you know, constant marathon running, for example, causing shin splints. We said that it causes, you know, little t micro tears and edema. If there's enough edema in that anterior compartment, that can also entrap um, the deep fibular nerve. Um, superficial fibular nerve damage um, a can occur um, or commonly occurs because of chronic ankle sprains. Um, every time that the ankle is sprained, it stretches that superficial fibular nerve. So chronic ankle sprains, for example, in gymnasts, can cause recurrent stretching of that superficial fibular nerve, which damages the nerve over time. Um, superficial fibular nerve damage results in pain along the lateral side of the leg and the dorsum of the ankle and foot. Um, paresthesias can occur, um, so like numbing and tingling can occur along that same area as well, um, and this typically worsens with activity. Um, again, here you just see this is the same picture as before with the two nerves. So another pulse that we can take um, in the leg is the dorsalis pedis pulse. Um, <clears throat> this is evaluated during a physical exam of the peripheral vascular system. Um, remember we mentioned that if somebody has a knee dislocation, we might worry about um, the popliteal artery. And if we're worried about the integrity of the popliteal artery, we want to check a distal pulse to make sure blood is flowing through the popliteal artery and down you know, to the foot. The dorsalis pedis pulse is a pulse that we can take in that case. Um, the dorsalis pedis artery, um, technically, it passes from the extensor retinaculum of the ankle, right, like the fibrous tendon that wraps around the ankle, um, to a point just lateral to the extensor um, hallucis longus tendon. The kind of easy way to say where it is is it just goes along the top of your ankle. <laughs> Um, so like as you go across the ankle and down towards the foot, that's where the dorsalis arter um, pedis artery is. It goes through the subcutaneous tissue along the dorsum of the foot, the top of the like, ankle foot. Um, it's very easily palpable, palpable um, especially with the feet slightly dorsiflexed. So again, if you point your toes, you're going to really tighten that, that tissue at the top of the ankle and it's going to be hard to feel. But if you just kind of slightly dorsiflex the foot, um, at rest um, and just let the person's foot rest slightly dorsiflexed. That softens the tissue up at the top of the ankle and you should be able to feel the pulse there. Um, and then you compare the strength of the pulse in both feet to make sure that it's the same. Um, if there's a diminished or absent pulse, that usually signifies that there's some vascular insufficiency. Um, so there's there's some problem with the blood making its way down the leg um, into this area. Um, <clears throat> signs of um, acute vascular occlusion include uh, pain, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis, and pulselessness, right? So this is the pulselessness aspect. Um, acute vascular occlusion, means the vessel is blocked, so the blood is not making its way all the way down to this artery. 
um, <clears throat> you can go start to check the, the pulses up and you can kind of find out where it is by you find the, the first place you actually have a pulse um, and then you know that the blockage is distal to that. Um, now, you notice I said usually signifies vascular insufficiency. Um, it is possible that the person does not have a dorsalis pedis artery. Um, it is the congenitally non-palpable dorsalis pedis artery is possible. Um, in this case, the dorsalis pedis artery is replaced by a smaller little vessel. Um, <clears throat> and it's not palpable in, in this area. So in that case, if you just if you feel a completely absent pulse on one foot, check the other foot. Um, because this is typically bilateral. So if you feel zero pulse in both feet, that's a sign that it's probably just congenital um, and that there's, there's no vascular issue occurring. Um, because the likelihood is you're not going to have acute vascular occlusion of both legs. Um, <clears throat> unless there's some like huge major trauma in a really weird situation. Um, the posterior tibial pulse. Um, is important um, when evaluating a patient for occlusive peripheral vascular disease um, <clears throat> or evaluating the peripheral vascular system. The posterior tibial artery passes deep to the flexor retinaculum, um, posterior to the medial malleolus, and anterior to the, calcan the calcaneal tendon. So the medial malleolus remembers that like medial ankle bulge. So the again, the, the rounded process on the inside of the ankle. Um, <clears throat> so just posterior to that um, and anterior to the calcaneal tendon. The calcaneal tendon is your Achilles tendon, right? That, that really strong tendon that goes in the back of the ankle. So just between those two, um, you should be able to feel the posterior tibial pulse. The foot needs to be inverted in order to relax the retinaculum, the tendon that's passing around that area. Otherwise, it will be firm and it's difficult to feel the pulse. So the foot needs to be inverted. Your sole needs to be like turned inward in order to relax that area, make it nice and soft and palpable. And then again, you compare the strength of the pulses in both feet. They should be similar. Um, pulses are absent in about 15% of normal young people. So again, just because this pulse isn't there doesn't mean that there's some sort of occlusion. Um, <clears throat> an absent pulse, um, so in young patients, an absent pulse in patients over 60 is uh, not common um, and is a sign of occlusive peripheral artery disease. Um, for example, intermittent claudication, um, intermittent claudication is something when um, that occurs when there's intermittent um, blockage of, of arterial blood flow. Um, narrowing or occluded arteries in the leg cause ischemia upon activity. So there's um, you know partial occlusion to the arteries. So the arteries have narrowed and they can't deliver as much blood. As long as the patient's you know inactive, they're not you know very physically active. The amount of blood that flows through is fine, but when there's increased activity, the patient needs more blood to the area, and they're not able to get it because the vessel's too narrow. So um, this means that you know when the patient increases their activity, they don't get enough blood flow. There's ischemia and there's pain. Um, so this results in leg pain and cramps with activity. When the patient rests, the demand for oxygen goes down, so they don't need as much blood flow and that occluded vessel can give them what they need, so the pain dissipates with rest. So if the patient experiences symptoms like along this pattern and you notice that there's an absent um, or diminished pulse in the leg where this is occurring, that is a sign that there's some sort of occlusive peripheral artery disease. This is showing you guys how to measure those two pulses, the dorsalis pedis pulse um, and the posterior tibial artery pulse. The anterior tibial artery goes into the dorsalis pedis, so that feeds the dorsalis pedis. 
Um, the calcaneal tendon reflex um, is one of the reflexes that we test, or it's also called the Achilles reflex. Um, the calcaneal tendon is the Achilles tendon. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the tendons that we, or one of the reflexes that we test in order to evaluate the health of the peripheral nervous system. Um, it's also referred to as the ankle jerk reflex. Um, what we do is um, we quickly strike the calcaneal tendon, that tendon at the back of the ankle, with a reflex hammer. Um, and we should get an ankle jerk um, or, or plantar flexion, right? The toes should flex upward as a result of that. Um, <clears throat> Or sorry, not upward. The toes should flex downward um, as a result, right? So when you hit the tendon, the toe should flex down. And because the idea is with any reflex is when you push on the tendon, right? When you push on this tendon, you're stretching the muscle that it's attached to. The body feels that that muscle is stretching too long. And the result is to try and contract that muscle to shorten it. So in this case, we're, we're hitting back here, then we contract the gastrocnemius soleus, um, and that causes the toe to point downward, right? In order to shorten that muscle back where it should be. Um, <clears throat> the patient's feet or legs should be dangling from the side of the exam table with the foot dorsiflexed, um, or in some position that allows the foot to be at rest. Um, the patient can be lying prone with their knee flexed as well. They can like lay on their belly and have their knee, their knee flexed so that their foot kind of hangs in this, this dorsiflex position. Um, we, a positive uh, re result is again, a quick, uh, brief plantar flexion. Um, and this tests the S1 and S2 nerve roots. Those are the nerve roots that carry that reflex. You compare the strength and speed of the reflex um, to the contralateral side. Um, if the S1 nerve root is cut or compressed, the reflex is virtually absent um, because S1 is involved in both the afferent and efferent limb of the reflex. Um, so it's involved with, with both. So if you have a problem with the S1 nerve, the reflex cannot occur. Um, <clears throat> we'll spend a couple slides talking about the calcaneal tendon. Um, calcaneal tendon injuries are present between like 10 and 20% of running injuries. Um, so 10 to 20% of running injuries involve some inflammation of the calcaneal tendon. Um, inflammation of the calcaneal tendon, again, very common in runners. Um, micro tears in the collagen fibers of the tendon occur with overuse. And um, this this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot that occurs when you run um, is using that calcaneal tendon. Um, this results in tendonitis or inflammation of the tendon. And kind of the major sign of this is pain back in the calcaneal tendon um, when walking, so when using it. Um, if there is a rupture of the calcaneal tendon, um, the rupture, complete rupture, results in excessive passive dorsiflexion um, and an inability to plantar flex, flex against resistance. So um, remember, like if this is your foot, you when you utilize the um, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, you um, are utilizing the calcaneal tendon, right? And that's when you plantar flex your foot. That's when you point your toe downward. Right? If there's a complete rupture of that, you're not able to do, you're not able to point downward against resistance. Um, there are some other minor muscles that can help you point your foot, but you can't do it strong. You can't do it against resistance. Um, <clears throat> also, you have excessive passive flexion because those are, um, flexion is like the opposite activity, right? And you need both in order to balance. If you take away the plantar flexion, then at rest, you have excessive dorsiflexion. The toes point upward. Um, rupture of the calcaneal tendon is common in patients with a history of calcaneal tendonitis. So again, like marathon runners who um, kind of have persistent tendonitis and that kind of keeps coming back and they keep pushing through it, um, that can lead to a rupture of the calcaneal tendon. Um, 
Also, in post-marketing surveillance, we have found that fluoroquinolone antibiotics increase the risk of tendon rupture. So antibiotics like levofloxacin, um, moxifloxacin, um, ciprofloxacin, those are the three most common. Um, those increase the risk of tendon rupture. So patients who are on those antibiotics should not be running. Um, weightlifters should not be lifting heavy weights when they're taking those antibiotics um, because those, you know, they'll increase the risk of a rupture, especially if they have a history of tendonitis. Uh, calcaneal bursitis is inflammation of the bursa of the calcaneal tendon. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the calcaneal tendon um, is between the tendon and the calcaneal tuberosity. Um, this top picture is a picture of the subcutaneous calcaneal bursitis. Um, there are two different um, there are two different bursa that are involved with the calcaneal tendon. Um, there's the subcutaneous calcaneal um, bursa, that's, um, forgive me, that's not, that's more like superficial to the tendon and the calcaneus and in the subcutaneous area. That's what this picture is showing you where you see the big bulge in the subcutaneous area. Um, there's also a bursa here that's deep to the calcaneal tendon. So that's the bursa that's between the tendon and the calcaneal tuberosity. Um, <clears throat> this calcaneal bursitis is caused by excessive friction on the bursa from overuse. So again, long distance running um, or, you know, professional basketball players, professional tennis players um, who are constantly, you're doing the flexion, um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. This causes pain in the posterior heel, um, especially during physical activity. Um, bursitis in the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa, which you see up at the very top, occurs due to excessive friction um, on the back of the heel. So if somebody buys new tennis shoes and they don't fit very well, or they buy you know, new work boots and they don't fit very well and they're rubbing on the back of their heel for eight hours a day for a, you know, a week straight, um, and then you see that there's this visible inflammation that's um, subcutaneous calcaneal bursitis. Plantar fasciitis um, <clears throat> occurs when there's straining and inflammation of the plantar aponeurosis. Um, remember an aponeurosis is like a flat, broad band of, of tendinous type connective tissue. Um, the plantar aponeurosis goes along the plantar aspect of the foot. So we're looking at the bottom of the foot. Um, typically, this is due to running or you notice that running is really, really bad for your legs, you guys. Um, it's kind of like throwing a ball is for the shoulder and the arm. Um, <clears throat> this occurs due to running or high impact activities um, like aerobics. Um, so like aerobics, that constant kind of jumping um, on the feet. Um, especially when improper shoes are worn. Um, shoes need to have, you know, the correct amount of arch support, not too much and not too little. Um, if there's not that support, then that, um, you know, causes irritation to the plantar aponeurosis and can cause plantar fasciitis. Um, this is associated with pain on the plantar surface of the heel um, and the medial aspect of the foot. Um, we see point tenderness on the proximal attachment of the aponeurosis. Um, the proximal attachment of the aponeurosis is on the medial tubercle, um, or process, medial like, process of the calcaneal tuberosity, um, like, which is just on the medial surface of the, the calcaneus. So like pain on the medial heel, um, point tenderness on the medial heel, and point tenderness along the medial surface of the, the calcaneus, the heel, and then up the medial side of the bone. Um, we also see um, pain with passive extension of the first toe. So if you pull the first toe, the big toe, if you pull it up, uh, like 
extend that that first toe that stretches out the uh, like pull it upward to extend it um, that stretches out the aponeurosis and causes you know, an increase of pain. Um, pain is further exacerbated by dorsiflexion of the ankle. Um, so, um, you know, if you flex your ankle upward, that further stretches it, um, or weight. So, you know, putting weight on the body, on the foot, also increases the pain. Um, this can be caused by a calcaneal spur um, on the medial tubercle. Um, because the medial tubercle is where this attaches, if there's a spur in the area, that can um, kind of overstretch and start the irritation um, of the plantar fascia. Um, <clears throat> it's possible for a calcaneal spur to be completely asymptomatic as well. So the calcaneal spurs don't have to cause this, um, but calcane calcaneal spurs near the medial tubercle can cause plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis can just also be caused because of somebody who has kind of a, um, you know, a exaggerated arch, not wearing appropriate shoes, or, um, you know, wearing the wrong arch support in their shoes. The plantar reflex um, <clears throat> is the, the uh, one of the reflexes that we do to test um, the, the nervous system. Um, in order to test the plantar reflex, the sole of the foot is stroked slowly. You can see at the bottom here the kind of path that we take. Um, we start at the lateral side of the heel. So you start out here. You make your way um, up the foot, up the lateral side of the foot to the base um, of your toes, and then you cross over to the first toe. So you start at the heel and make your way up and across. And then you repeat beginning just a little bit medial, little bit medial, little bit medial. Okay, so come up and across, up and across until you get to the midline. Um, you do this using some sort of blunt instrument like a tongue depressor, right? So like the little, like looks like a popsicle stick, tongue depressor you can use to, to run up the foot. Um, a normal response in children and adults um, is flexion of the toes, right? So like you can see this picture here, that's normal, flexion of the toes. The idea is um, this, this flexion of the toes is to get the sole of the foot away from that, that stimulus, right? That stimulus is, is, shouldn't feel good. It's, it's a noxious stimulus. It's uncomfortable. So the result is to kind of flex your toes and curl the sole of your foot away from it. Um, <clears throat> the extensor plantar response is abnormal. Right, so if you look here, that's extension of the toes and kind of pushing into it is an abnormal response. Um, <clears throat> like fanning here, you see abnormal fanning of the toes and, and extending the first toes to kind of push in. Um, that's referred to as Babinski's sign. So this second picture here, like the or the, the picture on the far right, that's Babinski's sign. Um, so. Babinski's sign is not abnormal in infants. Um, Babinski's sign is common in infants, um, and it can be present until about two years of age. Um, now, I'll tell you, the textbook says four, um, but resources, uh, most resources will tell you that Babinski's sign is normal until two years of age. Um, because there's underdevelopment of the corticospinal tracts in infants. Um, if this occurs in older children or an adult, if Babinski's sign is present in an older child or in adults, this indicates that there's some sort of brain injury or cerebral disease, right? So abnormal response indicates damage along the corticospinal tract. Um, the corticospinal tract, think cortex, down to the spine. So it includes the cord, cerebral cortex, the brain stem, um, and the spinal cord. Um, we have descending fibers that usually prevent the spread of sensory information. Um, 
but when the corticospinal tract is uh, damaged, sensory information will spread from S1 up to L4 um, and L5. That causes those anterior horn cells to fire, right? Telling the toe um, that it's getting hurt, right? We never actually touch the toes. Um, so the toes shouldn't think they're being touched. The toes should curl in to get the sole of the foot away because the sole of the foot what's being touched. But when there's damage, the sensory fibers travel up the spine higher and the toes think that they're the ones being touched. So the toes extend like that to try and get out of the way, but the toes aren't actually being hurt. Our spinal cords should stop the spread of that sensory information. Um, if it's not stopping it, then there's a problem occurring somewhere. Patellar dislocation occurs when the patella is forced out of the trochlear groove of the femur. Um, <clears throat> you know, the patella sits just right on that patellar surface um, on the front of the femur. And as the knee um, is extended and flexed, the patella kind of moves along the trochlear groove. Um, typically, if the patella is dislocated, it dislocates in a lateral position. So the patella is pulled laterally along the outside of the knee. Um, the reason that it's typically lateral is because the femur and the quadricep muscles are at an oblique angle to the tibia right? Like the, the femur kind of comes like that and the tibia. So the um, quadricep muscles, right? And the quadriceps tendon comes down along the patella. They're pulling at the patella kind of more laterally. Um, <clears throat> so it's more likely that it shifts in a lateral position. Um, this is common in young athletes because of the likelihood of, of excess force pulling on the patella um, or the likelihood that there's some sort of blunt force to the knee. Um, or like athletes, if they shift directions quickly uh, while the foot's planted, that can cause um, kind of a, a lateral pull too hard on the patella. Um, also more common in women because women have an increased Q angle, um, which just relates to the angle of the knee. Um, <clears throat> commonly, the patella will actually shift back into position when the patient extends their knee. Um, so, like, commonly before they even get to see you. So, it'll dislocate. They'll tell you it dislocated, then you will hurt, but the patella will be back in, locate, um, in the correct location when they get to you. The reason for that is um, that the vastus medialis, right, the, the quadricep muscle on the medial side, pulls the patella back medially. Um, it kind of counteracts that lateral pull on the patella. So when they extend their leg, the medialis helps to pull it back where it goes. Um, this is associated with pain and swelling of the knee. Um, <clears throat> if there's an imbalance between the lateral pull um, and the prevention of the pull, right? So like the the um, if the vastus medialis essentially isn't strong enough, that can disrupt the tracking of the patella. Um, and that disruption in tracking of the patella can cause uh, chronic pain of the knee, even without dislocation. Um, so sometimes patients will have chronic pain in the anterior knee. They don't have any ligament tears. Like, um, And the problem here is just a tracking issue with the patella. Um, in that case, strengthening the vastus medialis can help stabilize the patella in the correct position. This is also important, like if a patient experiences um, patellar dislocation, um, it's important that they do uh, physical therapy type exercises to strengthen the vastus medialis to prevent that from happening again. Um, here, this is just showing us the, the Q angle, um, which again is the angle of the knee. Here you're looking at um, or comparing the angle of the femur versus the angle of the tibia. Um, and that gives us the angle between those two lines, gives us the Q angle. Um, <clears throat> again, females tend to have, here you can see the male versus female Q angle. Females tend to have a larger Q angle, which just means there's a larger kind of lateral pull on the patella from the quadriceps muscles.
Um, I'll let you guys look at this, you guys. This is just showing us the ligaments that stabilize the knee. I believe you guys looked at these in the lab anyway, so I'm not going to spend a lot of class time looking at them. Um, <clears throat> but these are just the, the ligaments um, that stabilize the knee. You can see the uh, collateral ligaments, both medially and laterally outside of the joint capsule. And then within the joint capsule, you can see here the posterior cruciate ligament. Um, and you can see the anterior, um, the anterior cruciate ligament as well. And then each, each ligament has, um, you know, separate bundles within it. And then, of course, you can see the, the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus, which are the cartilage pads between the knees. Um, knee joint injuries. Our whole kind of part three PowerPoint is on knee joint injuries, um, but just really quickly, um, there are numerous different ligament injuries that can occur to the knee. Um, <clears throat> the MCL is the medial collateral ligament. Um, the collateral ligaments are the ligaments that are on the outside of the joint capsule. There's one laterally on the side of the fibula, one medially on the side of the tibia. The MCL is the one on the side of the tibia, the medial side. Um, so the MCL connects the femur to the tibia on the medial aspect of the knee external to the joint capsule. Um, this is there to prevent lateral disruption or dislocation of the knee. Um, so it's there on the medial aspect, holding the knee there immediately so that it doesn't pull out laterally. Um, it's firmly, the MCL is firmly connected to the medial meniscus, which is the cartilage pad that's there on the medial aspect of the knee. Um, <clears throat> an MCL tear can be caused by a blow to the lateral knee while extended. Um, so if you, a, a hard blow to the lateral aspect of the knee while the knee is straight will push the knee inward medially and tear that medial ligament. Um, also excessive lateral twisting um, of the flexed knee. When the knee is flexed, if the um, knee is twisted too much, you can just tear um, that ligament. Um, can also tear the medial meniscus. So when there's an MCL tear, it's important to check the medial meniscus to make sure that's nice and smooth. Um, that cartilage padding between the knee needs to be perfectly smooth so that the knee can move nicely, slide and glide along the cartilage. If there's any little tear or disruption in the cartilage, then the knee can't move nicely anymore and the knee can lock up um, because that torn cartilage kind of gets, gets twisted up and stuck between the bones. Um, <clears throat> MCL tears are common in football and soccer players um, because of the, the kind of constant, um, you know, planting of the feet and pivoting of the knees can cause twisting um, of the flexed knee. And then also a blow to the lateral knee is common in football when somebody gets tackled. Um, or in soccer, if somebody slide tackles somebody else, then, you know, the person gets a lateral blow to the knee and that can tear the MCL. Um, the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, an ACL rupture is one of the most common knee joint injuries that we see, uh, very common in athletes. The ACL or anterior cruciate ligament extends from the femur to the tibia, within the center of the joint. So the cruciate ligaments are in the center of that joint capsule. There's one in front and one in back. This acts as a pivot for rotary movements um, and prevents too much anterior movement of the knee. Um, <clears throat> um, ACL rupture occurs when the leg is rotated while the foot is planted. Again, this happens in um, athletes, right? In athletes who are like changing positions and pivoting quickly. They plant their foot and pivot the body and the top of the body, the femur twists while the tibia is planted in place. Um, that sudden pivoting or cutting movement, again, common in soccer players, football players, basketball players, common in skiing as well, um, because the bottom of the foot is stuck in the ski. So the tibia is held in place, but if the body starts to twist and fall, that pulls the femur and it twists the knee. Um, <clears throat> when the ACL is torn, sometimes the, um, 
the, the tibia slides anteriorly underneath the femur. Again, we said the ACL prevents an anterior, um, anterior movement of the knee. So um, when it's torn, you can have that anterior movement of the knee. We call this anterior drawer sign um, because the, it, the drawer, right? The tibia is the drawer, the drawer slides anteriorly. The PCL or posterior cruciate ligament extends from the femur to the tibia in the posterior aspect of the knee. So it's just behind the ACL. Um, it is split into multiple bundles. Um, it's got you know multiple kind of parts to it. It's kind of Y-shaped. Um, <clears throat> the PCL prevents posterior movement of the tibia. Um, the PCL is the strongest ligament that we have in the knee. Um, the PCL rupture frequently occurs when the patient lands on the tibial tuberosity with the knee flexed. Um, this is common in sports like football where people are forcefully tackled. So the knee is flexed and the patient falls on their knees, right? Like falls forward onto their knees and that hits the, um, like right onto that tibial tuberosity. That will um, push the tibia backwards. Right, and again, the PCL is there to prevent the tibia from, from going backwards. So if you fall on the tibial tuberosity right on the front of the tibia, you're gonna force the tibia backwards and tear the PCL. Um, <clears throat> this typically also ruptures the MCL or LCL, um, the medial collateral ligament or lateral collateral ligament as well. About 95% of PCL tears also occur with other knee injuries because again, the PCL is the strongest ligament that we have there. So if it's being torn, um, it's likely that that knee movement is going to tear something else as well. Um, the tibia slides posteriorly under the femur. That's referred to as posterior drawer sign. Um, the drawer is sliding backwards, right? The drawer is pulling out posteriorly. Um, the most common um, reconstruction surgery that we have to do involves repair of the or repair of the um, anterolateral bundle. Most of these or these ligament tears typically recur, um, require surgery. Um, usually we can just do um, arthroscopic surgery where we just insert the camera and the tools in order to repair the ligaments that are present or kind of file down the cartilage so that we have a nice smooth surface. We'll talk more about knee joint injuries um, in the, the part three lecture.